So, uh, hi everyone. Uh, this is very nice. I'm going to share my screen, and then uh, uh, as we as we proceed through the conversation, you can uh, collect these uh, uh, specific kind of questions. So, thank you for the invitation. Thank you for the introduction. I'm very pleased to be here and tell you a little bit about this AI in finance. And so, uh, I'm going to um, like you like you can see. I'm going to tell you a little bit about things that are. You know, AI is not the topic of the day, but I've been doing this for many years. So I guess uh, my understanding may be uh, beyond machine learning and obsession with deep learning. So I'm going to try to bring more of the AI picture to the to our discussion. So let me just first say that we have to understand that AI born somehow as a science in the mid thirties with Alan Turing, and then eventually becoming more concrete where the first time the term artificial intelligence was actually used in the Dartmouth conference in 1956. So it's a, it, it's a discipline that aims, has very ambitious goals. It's a science that tries to eventually match human intelligence. And human intelligence has many facets. And even like in the Dartmouth conference uh, proposal, this was stated like every aspect of learning, every aspect of intelligence could be reproduced by a machine. So somehow from day one, these AI science engineering and development has been a science of, has been a discipline of components, of components. So some people work on natural language, uh, the aspect of actually understanding language, speech recognition, all sorts of like vision. And then all these, all these, so the sensory, the perception, the data processing part, but other people work on a lot of like trying to build um, cognitive capabilities, like behavior capabilities, planning, reasoning, learning, all sorts of like thinking capabilities. And eventually we also care about the execution, which is like eventually trying to um, develop systems that truly uh, automate uh, the, the, the choices made by the cognition based on the data. So this data decision-making and execution or perception, cognition, and action are uh, home for many uh, interests of the AI research and development community, as you know. And somehow there are also people that have been interested on in putting it all together. So I've been one of these people that have always tried to build autonomous robots and I'll share with you, oops. Oops, where is my, oh, I didn't, I didn't put it here. But um, I've done autonomous robots that are capable of the three things and uh, the cobot robot that uh, actually um, Mikal very kindly um, shared. But what I wanted to tell you is like somehow this robotics world, these autonomous robots has been, has been a substrate for me to study this problem of combining data processing images in this case while the robot moves with the thinking, which is what's happening in terms of planning and all sorts of like reward optimization uh, in the computer on board, then eventually there are wheels and there are all sorts of like uh, uh, motion um, motors and all these that let the robot execute. They have sensors to listen to people, they have sensors to talk, they have actuators to talk with people. So in some sense, I've been uh, doing a lot of robots. If you go to my website at Carnegie Mellon, and this is an example of Cobot, this collaborative robot. So this is an example of something that I've done for many years and that I'll explain to you how I bring it also this type of like uh, understanding to JP Morgan. Okay, now let's switch to the business world, to the finance business world. And let me tell you about these, uh, and then we'll come back to the robots later, but let me tell you about this thing, this concept of really like um, uh, joining a 250,000 uh, people company, a huge uh, enterprise in the finance domain. And uh, interestingly, the finance domain, in particular JP Morgan, well, is uh, divided into four lines of business, like corporate investment banking, consumer and community banking, and then commercial banking, and then asset and wealth management and across uh, firm functions. And all these different, uh, these different kind of like, um, how can I say, um, lines of business do have a lot of data. And we'll talk today a lot about data because I think it's a very important concept here. And then there are a lot of applied AI really use cases. I mean, let's classify the emails. Let's like uh, try to have a chatbot, a lot of applied AI. And then AI research is trying to do 
some more transformative thinking. And that's what I'll talk with you more about today. And these, in terms of this transformative thinking, I want to introduce to you the seven areas in which we, um, uh, the seven pillars for all our projects. So it, we align our projects all within one of these seven uh, research goals. And let me explain to you them, there are the, these are goals. There are three which are very much related to the finance domain itself. Basically, how can AI uh, predict and affect complex economic systems, be it the microeconomics, be it the trading markets, be it like also the macroeconomics. So what is this issue about AI in this world of actual economic systems? And then we have this issue also about this large company producing a lot of data. So how do we liberate this data safely among different like uh, lines of business and even do the our partners externally, like our the, the faculty with whom we collaborate. And then we wonder, like, I mean, something that was quite new to me, we wonder what can AI do to eradicate financial crime? Financial crime is one of the most, how do you say, complicated issues that we face. And therefore, uh, AI, sh we, we work a lot on fraud, money laundering. And I, this, this, this talk, I'm not going to focus that much on financial crime, but I'll mention some projects at the end. And then there are three very important areas or aspirational goals, which is how do we empower our own employees? How can AI empower employees? How can AI perfect client experience? And how can AI actually uh, agentize policy compliance? So we have our employees, our customers, and our regulators, three stakeholders. And again, what is the role of AI for these three kinds of stakeholders? And then this overarching goal that hopefully the AI will develop will be ethically uh, correct and uh, care about social good. So um, again, uh, this is very beautiful. The reason why this is very important is that when you see it written like this, these seven areas, you kind of like, oh, kind. we kind of all think it's right. But I have to tell you that when I joined JP Morgan, I mean, I had to learn a lot about finance, which was not really what I knew about, but, um, it took me like a long time to find the pillars. And in fact, at the beginning, we had 30 such things. And then we went down to 12. And then we went up again to 25. And then we come down again to eight. And then I don't know, we moved, uh, we had like uh, months of uh, really two or three months of understanding how do we frame the work we do from a fine, frame the, the, in uh, JP Morgan. And these became what we converged to, these three domain kind of aspirational goals, these three kind of stakeholder-based based aspirational goals, and eventually these value-based aspirational goals, the explainability, the trust, the fairness, the non-bias, all sorts of issues that are of um, universal nature for all the AI systems. And it's still a, a lot of philosophical discussion here, several results uh, still, but it's, it's still... Um, one of the areas that we work, um, that we that we are working more, you know, incrementally. Okay, so uh, this is it. And now what I'll do is that I, I, this is the outline. So I mentioned something about AI a little bit, just this AI as a, as a discipline of components. Then I mentioned these research goals, so you understand. And now I'm going to focus on four projects. And in fact, um, uh, the first one I'm going to talk about is a little bit uh, beyond, yeah, it's for the multi-agent system, several, and then, I, I, but you'll see how, how, how I'll start. So, okay. So let's delve into this problem of uh, economic systems and uh, that are definitely multi-agent systems. There are many people trading, many assets. It's like a a world of like um, many entities and uh, competitors and uh, uh, non-competitors, so it's difficult. So when I was brought to the trading floor at JP Morgan, in fact in London, because uh, that's where uh, one of the floors is for trading, then of course I saw the, I mean, I've been to the one in Manhattan, but I was first in London. And guess what? When we were actually, um, people were giving me this tour of the trading floor, which I had never been to, but it looked exactly like what we see on movies. Uh, I could not stop looking at these humans, these traders, 
and seeing that the information that they actually were using to make decisions was basically visual. visual. So, you know, they basically look at the screens with some kind of like time series plot, plot. They are not using any computer in real time to, uh, to help them make decisions by no by. They basically look at screens and they, how do you say, they reach the perfection of looking at the screens. And so I started thinking, oh my God, you know, so after all, these uh, time series data, which we had many like uh, mathematical algorithms to analyze, could be seen literally as a bunch of pictures of images that then we used to train a neural net and we were able to learn the class by no by instead of cats and dogs or uh, apples and oranges or tables and chairs. Now the objects for this neural net were these time series plots. And we got tremendous accuracy in, the, in, a, in a learning these exact same by no by decisions, wrong or right, doesn't matter. We were basically just trying to learn how that, those particular traders were, were like uh, making these decisions and it was very accurate, okay? So what is new about this is the fact that we now can reason about images. And we have done this uh, Mondrian C, which is this decision-making image classification. We have done Mondrian P, which actually uses time series and image prediction. But it's interesting that it's, it's based on an image. And we have done Mondrian V, which is a time series and video prediction. So like, we'll, we'll delve into Mondrian P a little bit more. And we also saw Mondrian, uh, we are also working on Mondrian A for attention, which is a visual forecasting with attention we, 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 in which we see where do you put your, uh, your attention. But if you look at this video here, this is an example when it's green, it's like a training data. When it's orange, it's like a data that was uh, completed through by the learner. So you see that after this orange continues having the person run. I mean, they drop the, the jacket or something, but it doesn't really matter. The, what matters is that it continues running. And we have done something similar for uh, our assets for the stock market, but uh, I will, defer that for uh, our publications. But I wanted to show you, in fact, I wanted to show you this one in which this is a very compelling story in which um, you have all these kind of like um, uh, signals uh, up to this dotted line that were given as input to these neural net that learned to predict what the signal looks like. So basically you train these neural net on uh, many, many, many images in which you use the first 80% of the image and you then give as an output the 20%. So it's a prediction task. It's not a classification, whether this is a buy, no buy, but it's like a prediction task. So you train on these, we use thousands, thousands of images, thousands. And here were, these were, were basically almost, uh, uh, randomly picked out of these thousands and look at the red, the red curve, the red dotted line is the prediction by Mondrian P uh, based on this input. And it's remarkable. Look at this one here in which it actually predicts these uh, up and down based on what was before. And this one here, which is so good at predicting this is what comes next, everybody. And it's, uh, it's like something that what, what I want you to understand is like this. Um, maybe uh, I, I brag more about this than what you can think, but, but what I'm saying is like this. Think about the, 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 the ability to use images to represent or images to capture a time series data. And here we are able to do this and I forget, yeah, here it is. Here is a numerical machine learning method that uses the numbers instead of the images. And the predictions are much, much worse. Look at the red curves that uh, somehow are not able to capture the, the variations that the image 
eventually captures, okay? So this is the first thing I'll tell you, I told you, uh, which is uh, for us very compelling in terms of capturing uh, these uh, images uh, for decision making. Now, I'm going to tell you a little bit more now after this, I'm sorry, about, oops, about uh, the reason why I, talk, I told you about these images, these Mondrian, is because somehow um, the changes on that time series are really a product of many systems uh, trading, many agents having their own policies, their own interests, their own goals, their own uh, inputs, their own uh, risk uh, values, everything. And But it's interesting that we are able to capture somehow that complex multi-agent system as an image. But later on, or later on, no, but at the same time, we also, just a second, we also, I want now to focus on these other multi -age, other ways to capture this multi-agent system, in, in fact, to, um, to let them really uh, learn which policies to use. And in these over-the-counter markets and over-the-counter markets, I don't know if you are familiar with the term, these markets have two types of agents, basically the market makers and the investors. And the market makers do nothing else then basically stream prices at which they want to stay to 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 they want to um, they are willing to trade buy or sell an asset and basically they are um, offering these prices to the investors to which they are connected and then the investors basically their actions are to make a decision on which market maker are they going to transact with based on the pricing. So this is a complicated uh, problem. Uh, and uh, of course, if you price too high, no investor will come with you. If you price too low, then all of them come and that you don't get any benefit. So there is this horrible kind of like, how can I say trade off in terms of, uh, of learning. And as difficult as it is the problem of learning to, uh, to actually use those time series to decide buy no buy. These are also very difficult problems from the point of view of learning. So we have done these based on some exchange limit order book, of course, we have done this algorithm to try to figure out if we can simulate and learn market maker behaviors. And interestingly, we, we fix the investor types, which we don't assume they're learning, and we can play with uh, we can play with a lot of types of investor agents uh, according to some specific distributions of connectivity. But the interesting thing is that for these market makers, we basically uh, represent these market makers as agents, agents in the control in the MDP type of agents. They have observations, which are the trade the trades executed. They have the exchange prices. They have actions when you just stream the prices or they hold their inventory. So they hedge the inventory. They can both, because if the price is too low, you may want to hedge. So uh, you, then you have your rewards, which is you get positive rewards from trading with investors and you get negative for hedging. And there is some penalty for inventory uh, weighted by this risk aversion. So beautifully, and this is like something from a financial point of view that you can appreciate, we kind of reduced all this complexity to these parameterized agents that have basically a vector of, of these uh, different, like um, uh, a tuple actually, uh, of different risk aversion um, uh, parameter, and then the connectivity to investor types also as parameters. So these ma market maker agents are uh, distributions over this particular tuple. And you have different distributions you can have, and you have then different super types. So the question became, if you can actually learn, so I'm sorry, we can, I can show you this if you have not seen the system, Ray. We have used uh, the Ray, the reinforcement learning library of Ray, and we developed this shared policy training and we are flexible to map multiple agents to a policy. And eventually these high quality implementations of these uh, 
uh, multi-agent reinforcement learnings like the proximal policy optimization are supplied by these RAY system. And eventually we have been using them. And the beautiful thing is that we show that these market makers can actually learn uh, behaviors that are very, how do you say, very, um, uh, very rational, very uh, interesting, just by setting rewards and setting these parameters, and they learn to price skew for price skewing, to basically to adjust the relative pricing based on the bid ask uh, ratio and their own uh, inventory and they are able to basically learn this skewing from scratch. So this was very interesting. And we learned with many agents that you are able to actually do this through reinforcement learning. So this is my last slide on this topic. So this I'm covering the fact that you actually have, you capture these complex economic systems as agent-based, uh, um, multi-agent-based systems. And uh, with the definition of connectivity and risk adversity, and then basically you try to make this multi-agent reinforcement learning to learn these shared policies. And interestingly, in, in our NeurIPS paper, like uh, Nelson Vadori and Sumitra Ganesh, Prashant Reddy and myself, we actually introduced this concept of calibrating these uh, parameters in these agents by, through real data. So the real data is used to basically uh, make sure that the parameters you are cho choosing for, for the agents, uh, also that action of choosing the parameters is seen as a reinforcement learning agent action. And you learn both to estimate the agent parameters and the learning the behaviors themselves simultaneously. So this is just so you tell, so you see, at JP Morgan, I don't know if you face the same uh, thinking. I uh, we so uh, and I will go through these later on. Also, simulations is something that we have been um, have been uh, uh, working a lot on, and I'm going to forward this to the to to this issue about the fact that, that why is simulations also so interesting. Uh, the fact that real data is available, there is large amounts of real data, there's, uh, the, the data is difficult to access, uh, sometimes it's not even possible to access, but there is something about data, and I, I apologize for people that are um, very appreciative of data, but there is something about data, real data, that is not the best thing to do. Uh, real data basically captures reality, which is what happened, but it doesn't let you dream. It doesn't let you hypothesize. It doesn't let you to think about counterfactuals. So uh, there is a big thing about simulations, being able to go beyond the real data. And I am very passionate by, not, by this issue of not just copying the real data in processes that may need to be addressed uh, aggressively and need to be addressed promptly, even if they di differ from what the experience says. So I, 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 so we did that. And so to do this, we have used simulation synthetic data, which has been created from multiple sources through these uh, multi-agent based simulations, AI planning based simulations, and also GANs and uh, generative adversarial networks. But the goal is to eventually use real data or use uh, uh, multi-agent simulations calibrated by real data and let them go, let them go. And let's see what it does in addition to, um, uh, in, in, beyond the real data. So for example, Abides, which is another simulator we have by Tucker Balch, uh, basically, the, the, the goal here is to be able to simulate an exchange agent, which is, is a exchange agent like the New York Stock Exchange that basically based on the or executes the order book. But then you can create lots of agents. And here agents are literally pieces of algorithms with a policy, which basically says in this state. What which action should you take? Policies are mappings from state to actions. And it can be a probabilistic kind of like policy. It can be all sorts of like uh, 
uh, stochastic policies, but no matter what, they enable you by capturing that policy to go beyond just the plain historical data. So think about these as the historical data enables us to, um, how can I say, to tune the agents you have. So the historical data is very good for calibrating your agents. But then as soon as you actually have an algorithm to run the agents in terms of actually like these uh, parameterized state action policies, you can play the game. You can let it go. And by doing this, uh, the, the beautiful thing about this is that somehow we are able to create many different, many different market data. We many different, uh, how do you say, uh, regimes. Uh, we can have, uh, um, you can uh, mix different agent types with different kind of like uh, policies. And we magically, uh, in fact, we, this was the first implementation we, we did, we are able to generate synthetic, realistic data. But we can create all the synthetic data. So this is something that is very dear to our heart, and I'll share a little bit more about this with AI planning simulation methods. But it's very interesting from a, from a JP Morgan's point of view to delve into this world of not having, because of one reason or another, not having the ability or the need to use real data and still extract the statistical properties of that real data or extract the behaviors of that real data uh, through synthetic data. So I told you a little bit about this, and now I'm just going to delve into telling you about synthetic data that is created not by running a multi-agent system necessarily, but by actually using these AI planning techniques. So AI planning techniques, imagine like uh, route planning, AI planning techniques where, where you want to go from here to there, are based on a model of the effects of your actions on states. So if you are in this state, you move, you go forward, you'll be there. If you are in this state, you turn left, you'll be there. So it's this um, AI planning is this thinking about states and actions and a way to say when an action is applied, what is actually the next state. So we did this also for the financial world and we basically create models and I'll give examples in a second. We create models declarative, which some of them are learned from real data, but others we actually just write the actual set, the domain in terms of these actions and these uh, um, effects of actions and states. And then we solve and simulate the AI planning and then we let these uh, these actions, we start on a particular state and we just let these actions uh, create, execute, and we simulate executions in a, in, a, in a world. And then the result of all of that becomes the actual synthetic data, which tells, for example, for payments, payments that have been done. So for example, let me just concretely explain to you what's happening here. So if we think about synthetic data for payments. You know, JP Morgan enables payments all over the world. And payments end up being uh, some kind of client with some kind of account and many other features like country and I don't know, all the 200 features that are used to describe the, 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 the client basically just needs to make a particular kind of like transfer or a, a particular kind of like transition of money from one account to the other. So the state is represented as all these, how do you say, truths about the world before it's transformed with the actual actions. For example, a deposit, a check deposit. Well, if an agent with a client has a check, if it does a check deposit in the next state, the account has a higher balance equal to the amount of the check and the person doesn't have the check anymore. If you make a wire transfer from this account to that account on some amount, you basically have one account minus the amount and the other account plus the amount. So these actions enable you to execute things like, for example, a wire transfer that client 45 from account 12 paid to merchant 156 to 1,345 units, dollars, euros, any other type of unit 
what happens is that the balance, what matters here is that this balance of initial balance on account 12, 5,415.34 is decreased later, we get 3,000 by these 2,345. And the merchant 156 has some account and the account on, uh, on, uh, on the account 24, the balance is now added. So now think about this uh, ability to generate synthetic data as opposed to generate the synthetic data by, well, it's similar to simulating uh, markets or simulating, but here the payments, you are simulating basically all these actions. And the interesting thing here is that then this particular kind of states become just records in some Excel file that tell you at what time this happened, what was the transaction ID, the sender, the country of the sender, the beneficiary, the country, the amount, blah, blah. And this specific representation of the data is like the real data. The real data also mentions time, transaction ID, sender ID, sender country, beneficiary ID. And now we do this and we generate thousands or millions of these type of like payments. They are all synthetic, but they are also of the, of the right um, uh, real format. So we have done these uh, on, uh, uh, again, like here is like a wire transfer followed by a check deposit, followed by another wire transfer. So we keep like having states, performing actions and, uh, and uh, achieving all these different states. The payments data, we've done it also for fraud and uh, money laundering simulations. So basically we don't tell, I mean, we create this data, we don't tell anyone which client, client XPTO, client 34, is a fraudulent client, that, that's a client that perform, performs fraudulent payments or money laundering. And we have a whole model of what fraud and money laundering is, and we can generate synthetic data in which in the thousands or millions of records, uh, you are going to see some, you have, you see some that, there are some that are fraudulent. And the, the, from an academic point of view, why is this so important? And you can go to our website and have access to all these uh, synthetic data. So what's beautiful about this is that we can have collaborations with universities who have somehow uh, do research on fraud detection, on anti-money laundering. And now you can provide data to those uh, algorithms who can then test uh, if indeed this fraud is detected, there are many parameters you can tweak, like the amount of like uh, the percentage of fraud, how hidden it is, the, 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 all the probabilities of uh, money laundering. The money laundering is a behavior problem, it's kind of a network. So uh, you can decide on the size of those networks that are all parameters. And then you can challenge your own algorithms to see if these things are detected. So we have done, uh, so basically when we do another type of like domain, like, uh, you know, customer journeys, we basically change the actions. You know, we, we change the state representation, we change the actions, but the machinery to actually generate the synthetic data is all the same. Uh, because basically we always class, uh, represent actions as changing state, like, uh, you know, authenticate on an ATM or ultimate, you have a uh, check balances, transactions history. So you have all sorts of like actions you can take. Here, just two more slides, just giving you examples of uh, other, like in these um, uh, customer journeys, which is just re creating synthetic data of interactions of clients with the firm. And eventually the synthetic data in general is that you have a simulation cycle in which multiple clients are simulated, the merchants, the, the customers, all sorts of like uh, entities are simulated. And then these action sequences are created by solving these many state goal tasks. And the goals are generating according to a parameterized random distribution. And we also keep like a, a somehow you can, you may want to know what is the periodicity along the time that clients make payments. We use the real world also, the real data to tune all these parameters. But the outcome, it's like, a, it's a, the outcome are, is all synthetic data. It's like, fake news, okay, or fake faces, 
we are creating synthetic data of that nature, fake news. We don't like to hear fake news, but we love to hear about synthetic financial data because somehow it enables us to capture reality in a way that then you can do research on, you can share even among the multiple lines of business in the firm. So it's, uh, it's kind of like uh, liberating this data to be used without really endangering any privacy, endangering any uh, sharing of the reality because you know it's just a process that's the same. Just as a, 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 a how do you say, an analogy is think about uh, when um, uh, AlphaGo or when a chess computer program plays uh, chess games itself. When it plays with itself, self-play, for example, it's definitely not a real game. That those sequences didn't happen. Those legal legal moves followed by in that series don't didn't happen in any real game. There was no humans that played like that. So that data is really synthetic. It's examples of the process being run, but not real. Now, in a computer chess program, maybe there is no uh, effort to make the synthetic data be of similar nature to the real data. We here have a lot of, 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 our goal is to reproduce the same statistics, the same representation. So we use the real data to tune all the parameters in the synthetic data generation world, such that eventually what's generated never, never happened before, but it's still within the real, the real data. So this is very, very, I think it's very important for us to understand these, uh, big step forward in terms of financial world. So this is just a summary. Okay, so I have a little bit, uh, let me see. Okay, I'm just going to rush through these two last slides. Last, allow me five more minutes, and then we'll have only 15 minutes of questions. But I want just to focus on two more things that I think it's, are very important, and I hope you appreciate them. So again, from a data point of view, there is something that is, uh, how do you say, um, frustrating. Oh, okay, by the way, these all these work on the synthetic, on the generation of synthetic data through AI planning, the main developer is Daniel Bojajo. Uh, well, let me see, Mondrian was Tucker Bolch and myself, and then uh, the agent base is, uh, the, it's uh, Sumitra Ganesh, who is right there in the publications, and the synthetic data uh, through planning is Daniel Bojajo. And this work I'm talking to you about is Armin and Norvac. So I'm going to tell you one something. Look how frustrating it is when we work with financial data with, in which we mean financial data, anything that has to do with numbers varying over time. So again, time series data, but of any nature, it could be unemployment, it could be like a, a percentages, it could be dollars, it doesn't matter. So we have these financial data always represented in different formats. It's a real frustration. Everything is represented differently. And here is an example of macroeconomics and employment year. And so what uh, Armin did was the following. Let's assume that the data we get is always in Excel. Let's assume that, there is, that the data has, is numeric. And there are two types of non-numeric metadata. There has to be somewhere a time period and there has to be a metric, a, a hierarchy of metrics or a metric. And I'm going to tell you what this means. So look at this particular kind of example in which we have these consolidated statements of income in uh, millions of US dollars, three months ended some, some, some periods, nine months ended whatever, and then we have revenue, investment banking fees, principal transactions, and numbers, and numbers. So this is very different than the one we saw in employment, which I'll show next. But basically, uh, what we did with this Sphinx algorithm, this standard financial data extraction, was an algorithm that, was a, that is able to use visual and stylistic cues, uh, horizontal, vertical alignments, left indentation, and natural language, semantic cues, three months ended is a time period, the revenue is a metric, and so forth. And basically Sphinx, well-trained on these semantic cues and styles and visual and statistic styles, is able to convert any data 
um, we've tried many formats, more than 20 some, any data into these standardized data. So basically, if you look at these, uh, these particular kind of like uh, example, so every number in this table, 2,187 becomes one row. Uh, 14,700 is a row. Uh, 1,967 is a row. So you basically try to pick on each one of these numbers, make them a row and assign, call them value and then call, bring all the, the, the metrics by, look at, by looking at the, how do you say, at the language used. So this thing here, 2,187, is consolidated statement of income, which is here. It's revenue, which is all these rows, and it's investment banking fees, that's it. There is a period that started and ended here, that started in uh, July and ended through September, three months ended as a value, as a type, which is currency because we can extract USD from that kind of like description there. And we even know the scale, which is millions of dollars. So believe it or not, we are able to do this for all sorts of different data. For example, this one here is completely different but you go, it's percentages. So if the type is percentage, the scale is one and you extract this. And beautifully, uh, we are able to convert any type of these numerical financial data into basically uh, a standard representation. This has been a liberating uh, data uh, example also. And this Sphinx, the code, it actually it outputs JSON uh, outputs or TSV outputs. It runs in Python. And if you are interested, send me an email and I'll be happy to share with you this Sphinx output. Now, if you understand well, this is not the most efficient uh, representation for sure, but it's the same representation as all the others. That's a standardization that's a big value. From a machine learning point of view, now you can use this data in any system. So finally, I'm just going to mention one thing, and uh, I'm sorry, I just mentioned this, which is the final thing I'm going to say, the closest to the robot problem, in which we basically use human language commands, go to, so that we have done previously on the robot, which is go to Manuela's office, and the robot would actually execute these commands and move and go to my office or uh, bring, bring, bring a coffee to the lab and all sorts of like commands in language that were executed by the robot. And uh, basically the, what we did is the same thing for, for a task in the financial world that's very difficult, which is generating reports, whether it's PowerPoint or whether it's Word documents by commanding basically these uh, uh, skills of uh, PowerPoint generation, we map human language to skills. And I'm going to just show you a video here very fast of this thing actually working. This is called DocuBot, a bot to generate documents. So we can say, please run the execution analysis template for the last POV by order for company ticker XYZ today. And what matters here is that we type this language, we say this language, and all these slides are generated automatically. So here it's like the cycle of, of data, which is the Excel data in which this is all based, this particular kind of template, language, input, an order, a command, and then eventually the fact that the algorithm can actually execute like a robot. It can, the robot can move, as I say, go to Manuel's office. The, here, the DocuBot can execute and create the actual PowerPoint slides. Now, we can interact with DocuBot to ask for corrections. And you can say, center the figure title. Uh, uh, basically, change the color of the figure titles to black on all slides. We can say, modify. So, we can ask for different uh, appearance, different content, and we can ask for saving. So this is very beautiful because this is the dream eventually of AI, which is having this assistant that you can interact with, and it does the job. It is able to understand what you say in English, and it's able to execute 
based on these English commands. And in fact, these, these uh, docubot is always trying to learn this mapping between language and the actual uh, uh, skills or actions that it needs to execute. We can also ask to add a whole new slide. So not just fix these slides in particular, kind of like center the figure, move to black, uh, add this thing, but we can send add a new and now heat map chart of the imbalance time series data at the end of the report. And again, the, the document understands a new slide, understands at the end of the presentation, and here is the new slide that DocuBot uh, uh, automatically uh, added. So this is a very uh, interesting uh, AI system. This is, uh, I believe this is a lot of what my dream is also with robots, which is to have some kind of executor of your commands. And that's it. And now I will just finish by summarizing what I told you. We work on many other projects. And if you are interested, we have all the publications in jpmorgan.com slash AI. And you can send me email. My publications, also the, the, um, the financial world publications are available off my website uh, at CMU. So you'll see there that I've appointed to the publications at JP Morgan. Thank you very much. And I'll take questions now. Thank you so much, Manuela, for this uh, amazing presentation. So uh, a lot of, um, what, at least for me, is sort of out of the box thinking there. So I guess that's the benefit of um, having uh, speakers who are not exactly in your discipline, but, but still doing something similar. So, so that was yeah. fascinating, fascinating for me to, uh, to see. Um, so we have some questions in the chats, but um, before we go there, uh, one that I wanted to have, I find pressing um, also for you know, the, the conference and for here and for, the, for our field. So, you know, given that you know, AI is making bigger and bigger inroads into uh, finance, uh, you know, and there's a lot of you know, people like yourself coming from computer science or engineering, um, how can we as financial economists, I guess the, the audience is mostly financial economists, so how can we sort of contribute to this transformation? Bring you know, this is, um, how can I say? It's a very good question. And as you can imagine, I, 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 I spend my day interacting with you, with like people that are not computer scientists. And I interact with people that know about the business and have a passion for the business, uh, big passion, know a lot about the business. I, I think that the, oh, so the only thing I want is for you guys that, for people that are not computer scientists, you guys use Waze, you use Amazon, you use Netflix, you use Google, you use, uh, I, don't, I don't know, you use like Open Table, you use, uh, I don't know, all of this. So you have to dream, you have to dream and challenge us to say, oh my God, what if like, uh, you know, we could uh, make like uh, predictions or recommendations to our clients. I mean, Netflix recommends, what is it called? Like movies, right? Or Amazon recommends things you want to buy based on what you bought. Who knows what that algorithm is? You want the same thing for our clients. You want the same thing for our clients. So if like, a, you know, don't we question like, a, how do we come up with all these prices? I mean, there are algorithms. Do you realize that some kind of like a air, air companies, airline companies, aren't you always puzzled by how come the price is $1,232? Who figured out that coming this price? So someone, some algorithm is pricing. I guarantee to you that there no human is doing this. So what I think is that people need to see what they are surrounded by, understand that computers exist, understand that data can provide a lot of information and dream about things that you may want in the business. And that's what I keep saying. What do you want? And the other day they were telling me, we were talking, this anticipation problem. You know, we would like these machine learning, these AI systems to help us anticipate the needs of our clients. We would like them to detect fraud much better than we do. Uh, or in fact, uh, not even, not let fraud even happen. So when, so there are big goals and we, we cannot be shy of those big goals. 
That's what I'm telling you. The only thing I, so I don't have the classical answer that is like, is okay, we all have to upskill and everybody needs to know what deep learning is and everybody needs to know what AI is and now you all have to study AI. No, the AI knows the AI. I mean, it's like a surgeon. We don't become surgeons. We want the good surgeons that we tell them, oh, I have a pain here and they know what to do. That's exactly the, so it's about being very good at what each one does. I only want the people in business to be very good at telling me what are their dreams. And then the language problem, we have to understand the assets, the, the stocks, the, 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 I mean, whatever. We have to talk, but it's the dreaming based on the actual experience that matters here. Okay. So forget about wanting to understand what's deep learning. We have enough. We have enough. We have enough in our uh, apps, in our life for us to dream that maybe AI can do this for me too. <laughs> definitely that, oh, definitely very, something to keep in mind and to, to look forward to. Yeah. Thank, thank you. For thank you, Mikhail, sharing news. Okay. And, and once again, um, thank you so much for being here.